Jeff George and I were, were both physically talented, but everybody at that level is talented, and it's what you're able to do from Sunday to Sunday. And those who excel are those who can accept help and have an understanding that they're flawed and need to be better. This is Entrepreneurs The Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is The Playbook. This is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing, here with Entrepreneur of the Playbook, and I am thrilled to have Ryan Leaf with me. And I think Ryan and I share similar ex life experiences together. I've always felt, you know, from the time that I've met you, just this symbiotic nature because we really, I think, have the ups and downs of life. I mean, obviously, you're a superior athlete, but as far <laughs> as the other side of it, I feel great synergy with you. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, life in general is ups and downs. It doesn't matter you know, what background of anything. There's adversity everywhere. And I, I tend to tell people when I, I go speak that, you know, my story isn't any more important or less important than anybody else's. It's just, it's the same. I think that the notoriety that came with my, I guess, dumpster fire of a life for a while <laughs> um, gives me a unique qualifier to, to have a platform where I can speak about it. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, running Lee Steinberg and being so close to Lee, who was your agent? Uh, even when I first started from him, I would ask him questions like, who's the best quarterback, talent-wise, that you've ever had? And, you know, you had Warren Moon, Troy Aikman, Steve Young. Drew Bledsoe. Some really good ones. Yeah. Uh, but he always said the two most talented quarterbacks, skills-wise, were Jeff George and Ryan Leaf. And it's interesting because Lee also has had his challenges, like everyone else. What made your challenges so difficult? I'm a San Diego guy, so you know, being an agent and working for the company that represented you, and you being from San Diego, you know, drafted into San Diego. You know, I went way out on a limb because I thought the reason you were going to be so successful is that you were empowered, and Peyton Manning was entitled. That was the whole argument, yeah. right? It's in that guy. Yeah. That just shows you I know so much about people. Well, you, in life. you, you never know where that entitlement's going to come from. I. I wasn't taught it by my parents. My father is, you know, empowerment complete, right? He's a, he's a two-tour Vietnam veteran, uh, ran and owned his own company, raised three boys, um, and done an amazing job. So I didn't learn that, that concept from him. I developed this idea that success was money, power, and prestige. I really did. I don't know where Thank I you. found it. Um, and it, it, it changed my life in a way where I now had all the money that I thought I needed, which gave me all this power. And the prestige of being a starting NFL quarterback was what every one of my peers or everybody wanted to be in my life. So I thought I had success. And I didn't understand that uh, I wasn't entitled to any of that. Yeah, it's crazy. I had the same experience. Grew up with nothing. And I always say I self-entitled, which is, is really even, I think, a more awful thing than your parents entitling you because it's harder to get over. And all the challenges that come with it. It was interesting because I was talking to two of your friends uh, when you were playing uh, Rodney Harrison and Junior Seau. And I'm a huge Ryan Lee fan, you know, working with Lee, going, oh, you know, how's the kid doing? You know, I'm from San Diego. And you, you were surrounding yourself. You, you had the chance to be mentored by two great empowered men. Yes. I mean, these guys, the character between those guys and, and what they could have taught you. And they were expressing to me the difficulty that you weren't really open to having mentorship. I think I was, I was open to mentorship. I was not open to critical cri uh, criticism, I think is what it was. You know, yeah. the, the ability of someone showing me a mirror of how I was acting or behaving, I was not open to that because I, I disliked seeing flaws, seeing me as a flawed human being. I, I, like most people, dislike that. I disliked it greatly, especially being on a public platform and being in the face of a franchise and things like that. So it was hard for me to, to go through that process. John Carney who was our kicker at the time, came to me after, I think, year one, and he'd seen me struggle and, and, and seen the, the behaviors change in me a little bit. And he had a contact with, uh, who, who was friends with Tony Robbins. And Tony had offered me an opportunity to come out to his private island in Fiji and spend like a weekend working on self-help, self life skills and things like that. And I think my, I think my exact words uh, to John Carney were, fuck Tony Robbins. Nice. And uh, <laughs> that is essentially the mindset I was in. You know, I, yeah. I thought I could deal with everything. And I had my past. When, when things had gone bad in my past and I was backed into a corner, I was able to fight my way out with my physical talent. Like you said, Lee 
Jeff George and I were, were both physically talented, but everybody at that level is talented, and it's what you're able to do from Sunday to Sunday. And those who excel are those who can accept help and have an understanding that they're flawed and need to be better. So it, it's interesting because, you know, I believe all great athletes, they're a little bit OCD. They have this perfectionist, sure. right? And I, we had John Daly and, you know, even Dennis Rodman, all the great people. And unfortunately, that obsessive compulsive disorder, the same one Lee has, same one I have, we can use it for good, like you're doing now, or it's so self-destructive. There's, a, there's that fine line. I always... I, I, Keep it in simplest terms. I think there's like this this razor sharp edge that you live on between elite athlete in my case and like asshole. And it just I, I the balancing act is very very hard, and you you bounce back and forth between it until you land on one side for a significant amount of time. But I, I agree there is something about where you place your focus in something where it can be a healthy positive choice or a negative and toxic one. And but you have that choice. Uh, the positive and healthy one is always harder, though, than the negative and toxic one. That's just, that's an easier way. It's easier to, to be judgmental and fearful and angry than to be loving and, and take the high road. And that's, that's a perspective and a life experience um, education that comes with that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, as elite entrepreneur, same challenges. And my fears, uh, and I was an asshole, you know, that's what I eventually became. Yeah. But I, the, the challenge was that I only really was concerned about my intimate community, right? Like the disappointment in my parents, my family, I have a lot of siblings, the community in San Diego, the business community I had entered. So, you know, to lose everything, you know, that's where the shame was for me. What I always felt was unfair, and I know life isn't fair, but, you know, take the incident in the locker room. You know, I used to tell people, the amount they play that, even play it still today, right, yeah. of the top 10 worst quarterbacks of all time, biggest bust, whatever they call you, which, you know, is motivating, I hope, for you. And you take as a compliment because I think I know your philosophy now. But it was awful to think, like, people thought that happened 100 times. Right? It was one incident, but it was reflective of your... It was reflective, right. So, I mean, it was one time, but that was a caricature of me, of, of how I was. So if anybody met me, that was the... Even if they went in with an open mind, it there really wasn't an open mind, right? And uh, if you can take like your most humiliating uh, action you've had in your life and have it displayed for everybody to see before you were met, <laughs> that that would be that would be it. And so, you know, that's that's just. And it was at the at the start of the internet, and it became one of the first like viral things to right. to define somebody. And it it definitely. Uh, walked hand in hand with me through that through that that process. How do you feel today? I know you you and I both share illumination, right? We believe let's illuminate the flaws that we had and learn from them and you're a completely different person. But how does it make you feel, you know, and I get this now with the following, when people have this prejudgment of you and yet we still have that ego in us, this, you know, perfectionist ego, right. th this, you know, please don't I want everyone to love me. You know, the, all these feelings that we have that motivate us. But how do you feel now when someone's like, oh, there's Ryan Leaf, that idiot or asshole or whatever names they may call you, just off of prejudgment? Right. I mean, that's just uh, that's something I can't control. You yeah. know, it, uh, at some point you have to be accountable for your actions, but that then you have to essentially forgive yourself. And, may, and after you've made amends, you're doing your part. And you can't control what other people think of you. And... I, my therapist and I work greatly on this. We started using this affirmation about two and a half years ago. Um, and I say it every morning in the mirror. It's what other people think of me is none of my business. And it, that was hard at the beginning because it's, it's hard when you are, when there's validation in return of what you do. But when you are focusing your efforts into a place or, or a, a cause that is really about other human beings and not necessarily about how that makes you feel, but rather how it makes somebody else feel, that, that changes the dynamic, and it, it's shifted completely for me on, on how I view that. And you talked about forgiveness, which I believe is one of the keys to life, and you said something interesting, I had to forgive myself. I would say you only have to forgive one person. Because yeah. if you can't forgive yourself, you can't forgive others, and it makes life so easy when you've forgiven yourself. Well, my expectations for myself were huge. They were much much higher than everybody else's. The city of San Diego. Oh, no, no, except for mine, man. <laughs> I wanted the Super Bowl. I wanted that 20-year career. I wanted that, too. I wanted, I, wanted, yeah. I wanted you to be better at Warren Moon. I wanted all of that. Um, 
I'm I just did. teasing. But you had super high expectations. Super high expectations. And so when it was all said and done or when I walked away from the game, you know, and I was constantly told of how bad or, or awful of a player I was and then ultimately, you know, what a bad human being I was, I just, I, I started to believe it. And it was on, it was like on repeat in my ears. And I just thought it, the best decision for me was to, to disappear and go away and not give anybody any problems, uh, uh, not be an issue for my community, for, for anybody anymore. And that's exactly what everybody wanted. And, uh, and I never was able to deal with the actual problems that were at hand. Yeah. And who, who helped you gain that awareness who helped you that was close to you make this shift so that you are who you are today? Well, the, the Cascade County Sheriff's Department, you know, they intervened yeah. Yeah. Um, when, I, when no one else could and I couldn't intervene, you know. Essentially, I think it was my, it was my higher power that he that just simply sent the Sheriff's Department to come get me. They're coming right now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> great background. And, uh, and, and so it started there. Uh, I had many people along the way try to help me, mentors, coaches, family members and everything like that. but. Uh, I just I had to be humbled in a, in a different way. So he, here's an interesting question, um, and I, I dealt with this with Lee, and I, I have my own philosophy. I'm really curious. Along the way, tons of people tried to help you, teammates, community leaders, family members. You have a great family. What is it that like you know that a family member? What advice would you give to someone that you know has a person in need with them, a family member, an associate like I had Lee, my mentor. Right. Like, you know, I spent hours, I still kind of got choked up, you could see, because I could feel the pain of like helplessness. What advice would you give them to, you know, if someone in their family or, or so close to them is having problems, like what can you do? Well, I, I think it goes back to the, the control factor, right? You, you can't control what anybody else does. What you can do is offer your support, give them every opportunity uh, uh, to live a healthy lifestyle by offering this help, but you can't want it more than that person. And that's difficult, especially from a parent or a really good friend, because you take it personally when it's not. It's a disease or it's a, a choice on their part uh, on, on behavioral situations. So the best advice I can give and what I give to parents and family members and, and, and friends now is, is simply to support them. And they're, they're, they're going to be there to support them 110% when it comes to their recovery, when it comes to them being a better human being, but they're not going to enable, you know, the attic or negative behavior moving forward. And that usually will push a lot of people away. And that's the big worry, especially from parents that they may never see their family members again. They just want them safe and sound. And when it came to a point where my mom and dad asked me to turn myself back in, when I was safe and sound under their roof, where my mom knew I was gonna be, the strength it took for them to not enable my behavior, but actually say, will you go turn yourself back in? That was a turning point for our relationship and how they dealt with their addict son. Yeah, letting someone bottom out uh, as a parent, I couldn't, I mean, I had a close friend, Lee Steinberg, and Warren and I both who were partners with him to let him, you know, live in a county facility, you know, a halfway house. And, you know, it, it, for me it was so difficult because I'm a deal maker. I was making money, regenerating Lee's business again. And every time we got a huge opportunity and a huge deal, he would tank. Right? It was like a, almost I would feed him that he felt secure. So now he just self-destructive. He was, you know, all the issues. And until we allowed him to own it, and I think it, we felt it could go either way. Right? Oh, it and, always can. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where I'm going to be five years from now. I could be back in a prison cell. Cancel. Yes. Yeah. You, 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 you don't know. I, I do know if I do what I'm doing today, again tomorrow, most likely I'll lay my head down peacefully. Uh, living an unchaotic life, and that will continue. But I, I'm not, I don't venture to look what, and, and because amazing things have happened since I got out. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's truly what we call the promises. I mean, it's promised to sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, these things happen if you're willing to work for it. And that's what, that's what I'm doing right now, along with my family, who walked that path with me too, and they're experiencing the joys um, that I am as well. So you, you talk about forgiveness and humility. The big shift of your life, as far as I know, and the same with mine, is I shift from being a taker and achiever and an ego-driven person into just being of service. Well, yeah, so that, that was the foundation, right? So I was in prison and my roommate, who was a, an Afghani Iraqi war veteran, uh, you know, felt comfortable enough one day to get on me about how 
I didn't understand the, the value I had and how I had my head buried in the sand. And, and he saw that I wasn't resolute, I think, being this person. And so he su suggested we go down to the prison library and help prisoners who didn't, who didn't know how to read learn how to read. And I went begrudgingly, and I've had many of these like come to Jesus moments in my life that I literally like flipped the finger at. Um, <laughs> in this case, I went, I showed up again the next day and the day after that, and I realized I was being of service for the first time in my life. So, and I knew that was going to be the foundation for when I got out, and it was. And I found a place here in Los Angeles that allowed me to be that person, which was working within recovery communities, uh, a company called Transcend Recovery Community, and I started a nonprofit uh, called the Focus Intensity Foundation, which raises money for scholarships for people who can't afford substance abuse and, and, and uh, mental health care. Because when I got out of prison, I, I couldn't afford it either. And if it weren't for the NFL grants that were available to former players, I wouldn't have been able to seek out the treatment I needed. So that essentially is where my foundation is, is based in service. But that doesn't mean, and, and I'm sure as you found out, and Lee has too, you can be successful and can have abundance by being of service to other people. I mean, you can still have all those things as long as you remove yourself from the equation and know that you know, all that stuff can be taken away from me and that would still be okay. Uh, that, that was the important thing. I just, the most shameful thing that I ever went through, being a felon, being a burglar in my hometown, the most shameful thing was ultimately telling people that I had lost all that money. That was the hardest thing for me to do. I don't know why, because it was just, that was my identity, that that was what success was, this money and this. So that was the, even, that was the last thing that I finally came open and honest about, that I had, you know, had all that money and it, it was gone. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, you know, through my, my whole identity was, I grew up poor, I just wanted to be rich to help my mom. Right. So it made, to me, even, I think, more duplicit in the pain that the hardest moment in my life, what, I had three daughters at the time, a wife. I lost my home in Rancho Santa. They pulled up with sheriffs and, and things that take everything that I owned. I mean, it, it was shameful. But the hardest thing was to walk into the house that I bought my mother. And tell her that. And tell her and also explain to her that they're going to have her move out of her house, the one that I gave her, uh, you know, because of my idiotic, egotistical, arrogant, I mean, I lost more money than one day that I could have retired my mother. And That's the biggest thing for me. I know how far a dollar goes now, right. you know, and what I can make of it. And now that I have a son myself of where all, everything I work for now goes to those two. You know, it, it really allows that selfless nature to come, at least for me now. But the understanding that if I don't do the next right thing, the same type of thing like that can happen. All that stuff can be taken away and it can affect the family in a way where, um, you know, my mentor really, he, he, he preaches to me that anything I put in front of my sobriety or in front of my recovery, um, I'll lose. And I think that's the best point. It's a, it's a very serviceable program, but it's a very selfish one in the fact that it's all about me being better, which allows me to be better for everybody else around me. That's interesting because I, I've been blessed that you know I, I didn't become an addict. I have the personality for it. I, I, I've used and tried things. I just am blessed that never happened to me because it easily could have. Right. But for me, you know, I, I have that thing. For me, is nothing comes before service to me. Like the minute I put myself before others, all that's going to happen again. So it's interesting. I've never thought of it in the terms of, of an addict, but I have this, always have three priorities from being of service to my health is, is the other side of it. That I, Everything was before my health, my job, my family. Yeah. And, you know, turning 50, I'm so glad that I shifted that because, gosh, you know, if I'm not here, what good am I? Well, I think that, you know, I think a big problem in this country is because people compartmentalize addiction and and. Workahol workaholics and stuff right. like that. It, it, they're all the same thing. They're mood altering. We alter our mood because we're not we're not okay with ourselves or with who we're with or anything like that. So we alter it by working harder, longer hours to be more successful, have more money. In my case, I just self medicated with something that that altered my mood in a way that made me not feel any of those things. And I think if we can all generalize them as as the same thing uh, and and put those fundamentals in place, those ideals, which for me have been replaced with with accountability, spirituality, and community. Those those three things are what now 
guide my way, and they have none of them to do with what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, or what kind of money, amount of money you have in your bank account. I agree. And I talk about vibration and ideals are the truth and the truth vibrates the fastest and we use all types of things to lower our vibration so that we feel like we belong, right? That we don't have that pursuit of our potential and you have so much potential. Last question, everything that you've been through and you know, I can honestly tell you right not to kiss your ass on this show, <laughs> but I, I was a huge fan of yours when you were young. I am absolutely a bigger fan now and would do anything for your charity and for you, but what le everything you've learned, what legacy do you want to leave now? Since we're not going to have a Super Bowl in San Diego, yeah. and you let me down there, what's the new legacy? <laughs> I, I think, you know, I don't know if I'm necessarily, I don't like the word legacy, but I do know this. When I, when I proposed to my, my fiance uh, at our engagement party, or uh, my little brother came to her and asked her, what, what was it about Ryan that finally you know, you knew he was the one. And she told him that I was the honest, the most honest man uh, she'd ever met. And my brother just fell on the floor laughing because, <laughs> of course. He's that, your brother. <laughs> he's known me for 38 exactly. years and that's not the guy. Yeah, your that, snapshot. Right, right, that's not the, but now that's the definition that I can leave now with the relationships I make since 2014. You know, that's those are the relationships I'll build now and that's the definition of me. Wouldn't that be amazing if people asked the definition of you and the answer was he's, he's the most honest man I've ever met. And that, that for me would be uh, the ultimate legacy. Especially from people who know you best. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, I love that because I tell people all the time, you know, people say things about the asshole Dave Meltzer and I say, yeah, I, I get it. You know, and, makes and family makes sense. My brothers would laugh their ass off if someone, and, and they still do. Like yeah. they, they laugh and see the videos. Oh, yeah, Dave's so of charity. He's so not right. Well, I shared a room with my brother, the rabbi, and he's like, why don't they say that about me? Because he's been that way since he's been little. Right. So, but I would prefer. There takes something. There's something about climbing to the very top and getting just knocked, not only on your ass, but like ass over tea kettle all the way yeah, down almost to it. out right <laughs> and to 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 climbing back up and it shouldn't be taken away from somebody who was able to to climb that that mountain and stay there yeah but for whatever reason it is and then it's important that you and I continue to use this platform to do that because people need somebody to relate to because actually watching somebody stay on top and not feel like they're they've dealt with a lot of adversity like I look at like Tom Brady, you know, even though we both have like the relatability of playing in the Rose Bowl and playing quarterback in the NFL, I look at him and I'm like, I cannot relate to him. And then I walk into an auditorium where everybody looks at me and like goes, oh, that Ryan Leaf, man, he was fucked up. I'm just like that dude. <laughs> right. And so we, exactly. can re we can relate to that and it, and it makes sense. And I understand that. Well, I really appreciate you. And I really appreciate you being on the playbook to share this story with, uh, you know, all the people with Entrepreneur, because your story, like you said, it applies not just to football, but to business, to life, to relationships. It is, and it's, it's amazing to, the business acumen you pick up as a professional athlete, and don't utilize it enough unless you really have a mindset for that, to being where I'm at now, starting my own business, and, and seeing that grow, and seeing how, how to do that the right way. Because you picked up a lot, you just didn't realize it until it was too late. And now you know how far a dollar can go. You're able to work in the business world like you never have before. Yeah, well, don't even call it a comeback. We've been here for years. This is Ryan Leaf with Dave Meltzer on Entrepreneur, The Playbook.